geo geoscience at the oops sorry at the University of Bristol specializing in geomicrobiology, geomicrobi uh, the study of how microorganisms influence environmental processes. Um, Casey is particularly interested in how microbial activity controls nutrient fluxes and greenhouse gas emissions in peatlands, both in the UK and the Arctic. Uh, Finn is a PhD student at the University of Bristol, whose research examines the changes in microbiology and geochemistry that occur during peatland restoration. He's a part of the GW4 Fresh Group, a group of academics and partner organizations focused on tackling the challenges that face freshwater environments. Finn was previously at the University of York, uh, where he worked on projects to understand historical environments on Earth using the records stored within peatlands. Casey, Finn, over to you. Great, thanks for the nice intro, Brad. And um, yeah, thanks as well for the invitation to join this forum. It's been a really, really interesting morning. Um, so what Finn and I hope to do was to think about biodiversity on maybe a much smaller, but hopefully a no less fascinating scale um, by talking about the role of microorganisms in shaping peatland processes and specifically the work that um, Finn has been doing for his PhD looking at how microbes shape their responsive peatlands to restoration specifically in the Brecon Beacons. If I can have the next slide Finn, I feel like uh, Chris Whitty. Um, so the reason we're really interested in peatlands is because they have a really disproportionately important role in the cycling of carbon within the Earth system. So they only cover about 3% of the Earth's surface, but they store about 30% of soil carbon because they are these very carbon rich wetlands. And in the UK, we are actually the custodians of a really important part of the global peatland store. Um, so we have much more peatland coverage than, than the average country. And that means that we also have the responsibility to protect them and help them fulfill their kind of carbon storage potential, um, which can really help in tackling climate change. The issue in the UK is if we're, you know, anyone who's done a lot of walking in the uplands is that all of our bogs in the UK are in really quite a sad state. So I think we have less than 20% of, of all of our bogs and especially um, upland blanket bogs are in a really, are in a natural state, whereas most of them have been really heavily impacted by historical management issues. So that would be things like draining them for agriculture, also peat cutting for things like compost and even just pressures from overgrazing and you know footpath erosion and, and just people being in the uplands. And the issue with that is that it's turned these really important carbon sinks into kind of problematic sources of carbon because we're seeing devegetation. So you see all of these kind of bare peat areas that should be covered with vegetation and, and wetland type moss species. Um, and they're just completely bare. And um, we see a lot of erosion, the peat becomes drier and it starts to decompose and releases greenhouse gases. And it's not only a climate issue, but is also quite a big problem for us in the UK because about 70% of our drinking water comes from upland peat catchments. So there's a huge amount of effort, um, especially in Wales, um, to try and restore and protect these sites in order to get their kind of climate benefits upped, but also to make it much easier to treat our drinking water so it's not as costly and it doesn't cause so many problems down the line. Um, I want to pass over to Finn now. So Finn's going to talk about the why we think that microorganisms have an important role to play in that um, and specifically what he's been doing in the Brecon Beacons. Thanks, Casey. So to introduce the role that microbes play in peatland function, we can take the example of a, a natural system. And in healthy peatlands, we know that carbon is being sequestered, it's taken up from the atmosphere, and it's stored in the peat mass. Um, and that uptake of carbon as carbon dioxide is being performed mostly by the, the plant communities which are living on the surface. And when these plants die, they remain in the bog, and for the most part, that matter is kept uh, below the water table. And it's that waterlogging in the peatland which means there's very little oxygen present in the bulk of the peat. And this lack of oxygen means that only specialist microbes, which are adapted to those conditions, are active in the, in the peat 
These anaerobic microbes can only break down the, the carbon that's being put into the system by plants very slowly, meaning that the, the majority of the carbon is preserved in the food. As a result of some of the breakdown that they do carry out, these anaerobic microbes can produce some methane gas, which you'll know as a, as a, as a potent greenhouse gas. But crucially, this system in a healthy peatland is accumulating much more carbon than is being lost by microbial breakdown. So a carbon sink. Unfortunately, many peatlands in the UK aren't in a pristine condition. And in fact, as a whole, as Casey said, they're, they're now considered to be a source rather than a sink of carbon emissions. And this is primarily due to, to drying and draining, whereby the water table is lowered, and this has exposed a lot of the peat to air and to oxygen. Deeper down in the peat, we might still see a community of microbes more similar to an intact peatland, as we're again below the water table in a low oxygen environment. But in the upper dried peat, a different community of microbes can thrive. And these aerobic or oxygen using microbes are much more efficient at degrading the carbon stored in the peatland. They consume the carbon rich plant matter. They turn more complex carbon based molecules into smaller, simpler ones, which are more easily transferred into gullies and streams as well and lost from the peatland. In the example here on the, on the right, there aren't any plants on the peat surface, and so there's no in input of carbon into the system, such that we have a complete imbalance of carbon. But even when there are plants on dried peat logs, the system is still quite likely to be out of balance when it comes to carbon storage, unless we can stop or slow down the degradation by these aerobic microbes, which is causing net carbon dioxide emissions. And so to restore peatlands, um, which is something that's an effort that's accelerating in the UK and definitely in Wales, we, we therefore need to re-establish two things. We need to re-establish both an input of carbon into the peatland by making sure that we have a, a healthy community of peat-forming peat plants on the surface. But that's, that's one side of the coin. And we also have to try to exclude the aerobic microbes that will break down the carbon stored in the bog. Of course, this is principally achieved by developing the, the low oxygen conditions that you would see in a natural peatland conditions which the aerobic degrader microbes can't tolerate, and that means waterlogging of the peat. Now, some of you might be familiar with the sites that I'm mentioning in this presentation. There are several places in the National Park where peatland restoration is happening, um, but, but all three of these images were taken up at Weinvigen and Bellin. And as you can see, as well as restoring the surface plant community and um, by replanting things like sphagnum mosses, the restorations also involve uh, ditch blocking to, to hold back water from the site. And of course, raising the water table will hopefully help to restore the microbial community to something more like we see in a healthy peatland. And we can see at Weinvigen and Bellin that there are some areas of the bog which are quite wet. Um, the image on the right here has a nice plant surface community with a carpet of sphagnum mosses as well as the cotton grass there. But there are also areas that have experienced quite severe degradation over at least the past 70 years. And, and those are areas which have undergone a significant amount of, of drying. You can see these areas often have a, a bare peat surface, like in the image on the left. And, and th this obvious difference in terms of the lack of plants in these areas of the bog is again only half of the story, because below the surface, we would also expect quite a dysfunctional microbial community in these degraded areas of bog. In other peatlands, it's been recorded that there's much lower levels of microbial bi biodiversity in degraded peat than you, you find in natural areas of peatland. And of course, those microbes in the degraded peat are chewing their way through all of the carbon. But also at Winding and Bellum, we have areas of bog that, are, that look like this central image, somewhere in between the two. And that's where some of the restoration effort has, has started to pay off. And we've seen recolonization of the surface with lots of, lots of plants. There's some cotton grass, some, some heather, even some sphagnum moss taking, taking in places. And what we want to look at with our research project is whether this shift, this improvement, is also reflected in the microbial community in the, in the different areas of the bog. And this project has two key aspects. Firstly, we want to look at the conditions in the peat, essentially to understand the habitat that's available to these microbes. And secondly, we also want to identify the microbes themselves and characterize the communities that are present in different regions of the bog. To understand both of these aspects, we take a lot of samples. We can sample the, the water that's held throughout the peat profile by using these membrane samplers uh, you can see on the left, and um, which are in inserted vertically into the peat and which fill with time 
uh, with pore water that we can sample. And with those samples, we can look at chemical parameters like how acidic is the environment, uh, what nutrients might be available for the microbes to use. We also monitor the water level in the bog to see how wet it is, and to see whether the restoration is having an impact on the water table. And of course, we also take samples of the peat itself. And for that, we use this long pourer on the right. And because the peat in, in, at Wine Big and Bellin is up to four and a half meters deep, and we need quite a long pourer. And from the cores we retrieve, we can look at the physical aspects of the peat, like it's how dense it is, how much water it can hold. Also, chemical factors like how degraded the peat material has become. And from those peat cores, as long as we sample carefully, making sure that we don't contaminate them with, with microbes that we have on us and, and that are present at the surface, we can also use those samples to look at the microbial peat in different parts of the peatland, degraded areas versus more restored areas and natural areas. Traditionally, to, to look at and identify what microbes are living in an environment, you might have tried to cultivate the microbes from, say, a sample of peat, take it back to the lab, and you could try and try and grow the microbes and identify them, understanding their function. But unfortunately, not all microbes take well to being cultivated. Some of them would rather be growing in a bog than they would on your culture medium. And so you wouldn't get a complete picture of the community living inside the peatland. Nowadays, luckily, we can sequence bacteria uh, as well as fungi and archaea, which is a group of microbes that includes the, the methanogens that I mentioned just earlier without first having to culture them. And the technique that we'll use to look at the microbes at Fine Drink and Berlin is called 16S sequencing. And it's, it's an approach that's called that because it looks at a particular gene called 16S, which can be used as a marker for different types and species of, of microorganisms. First though, we have to amplify the gene so that there's enough of it to identify it. These days we've all become quite familiar with the term PCR, with it being used in coronavirus testing. And that's basically a process which can amplify genes that you're interested in so that there's enough for you to observe and identify the micro, in that case, coronavirus, in our case, uh, peat microbes, whether they're present or not. So we'll also use an amplification process. And then we have an, enough of the 16S gene sequence. And essentially, that sequencing is reading off the genetic code that's held in the gene. Different microbes will have different differences in the genetic code. And we can start to group together similar sequences. For example, the aerobic decomposer microbes who all perform similar functions, degrading carbon in the peatland, will be more similar to each other than to the anaerobic low oxygen microbes. Once we've determined the different groups present, we compare their sequences to reference databases and repositories. Uh, so these, are, these are held online and there are other people have also recorded their own sequences and we use this to identify the different taxa of microbes. The bog. And this tells us about the, the composition of the community living there. And what will be really interesting to us is what impact the restoration that we've seen at Weinberg and Berlin is having on the microbes. There have been huge changes at that site since this photo was taken back in 1990. And, and the most apparent one, of course, is that the site has been largely revegetated and is starting to resemble a functioning peatland again. Will the microbial community in the restored areas of the bog also resemble their counterparts in a healthy system? Or are some factors meaning that this, that the aerobic degrader microbes are still hanging around? Understanding it's, that's really important because of the key role which microbes play in a bog's carbon balance and in determining whether the carbon loss both to the atmosphere and through streams can be halted at Wine Big and Bellin and improve some of those issues that Casey mentioned to do with the water quality uh, that, that runs off the bog and its role in the, the climate crisis. So that's, that's our talk completed, but we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Finn. Uh, I've had a question just pop up. Uh, is there any merit in inoculating degraded bogs with particularly good strains of microbes from one natural system, or are they already there in low numbers? Do you want me to take that one, Finn? Yeah, go for it. Um, that's actually a really good question. I think the, the short answer is we, we don't actually know yet. So I think we still have to get a much clearer picture for what the microbial communities in healthy bogs look like before and how different they are in degraded bogs before we know if that would work. But there definitely 
is an argument for doing that. So that's something that is done quite a lot in, in agriculture, where if you can identify something that has a really helpful function, if you, if you inoculate it, it, it really might actually help. Um, but I think we still know so little about the microbial diversity in, in peat bogs in general that we're still a way off of that. But it's definitely something that people are looking into. It, it could well work. And I think leading into there's another question um, in the chat that's come through about the, the DNA barcode and the 16S sequencing. And, and it, it, it again touches on this idea that we, we that Casey mentioned that we don't necessarily have a complete picture as, as to what microbes are, are even present in healthy, healthy peatland systems. So the question was about how complete is your reference library for the species we're interested in. And it's another thing which, because there's not been a ton of research on peatland microbes, it's quite possible that when you when you carry out the sequencing, you you don't have a full picture already in these reference libraries about what you're finding. Or, or you even find species which are present in other environments that are in the peatland. And especially in some of these more degraded peatland systems, it might be interesting that actually some of the some of the species we find might not be typical peatland microbes. They might be microbes which you'd normally find in, in drier soil systems. Um, but again, it's something that that we don't really know yet. So that's why this project is, is quite interesting. Yeah, maybe one thing to add to that actually, because what we what we can do if we identify that there's a microorganism that's that's really important, but we don't really understand its function, we could do a different type of sequencing where we actually sequence the whole genome of that organism. And then that tells us much more about what its potential function could be. So we can see, does it have the ability to use oxygen and degrade carbon, or is it more of one of these anoxic microorganisms? And if we have something that's really interesting, but we don't really know what it is, there's some other methods we could use to dig a bit deeper on that. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Finn. I, I, I've got a question for you related to all that, because because a lot of what you're talking about really ties together some of the issues that, that Ray Woods just talked about in terms of verification and expert uh, uh, having the experts to do that um, all the way back to what David Roy was talking about in terms of technology and going forward in the future. So as a, a, an environmental records center, one of our jobs is to, to keep those records and, and build that library, so to speak. And, and we're not quite set up for that just yet. Um, but how do, how, do we, how do you foresee maybe going forward in the future? What types of things do we need to have available to us, like this library, for instance? How do we get experts involved who have that specialist knowledge to, to help you know, uh, verify those records going, going into the future? So one thing that kind of came to my mind earlier in some of, like some of the earlier talks when you're thinking about how to deal with these big data sets is I think there's actually a lot that we could all learn from looking at how the microbiology community actually deals with data like that, because these data sets are enormous and these kind of online repositories that they have are, are kind of honed over maybe like the last 10 years. Um, and they actually exist some really good systems for kind of recording the metadata, which is really important. So like, where did the samples come from? How were they processed? How were they collected? And that's all really important sort of verification stuff. Um, but also just in terms of how to actually manage and search through that data. Um, there's, there's really good systems in place for this kind of data elsewhere. And I think if there's a way to link up those so that we're kind of doing a lot of the analyses on these external databases, but then we can have a way to sort of keep the records linked to the local area, then you get kind of the best of both worlds because you don't have to have the computing infrastructure to deal with that level of data, but do have it available and linked to the specific place. That would be my suggestion. I don't know if you want to add to that, Finn. I think it's it's something that will be a really important thing as well as 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 more and more sequencing happens. I mean, the change in this sort of field, in, even in the last twenty years, is so immense that as we move forward, you know, with more and more the, the number of records is sort of will become, in, you know, it's, it's exponentially increasing. So having those records linked to the to the, the places where they've been recorded is kind of vital. Otherwise, we'll just have you know huge huge amounts of records that but they're not, not being used. So we've got a, another question from Berwyn. Um, when you mentioned how deep the peat marshes extend, what sort of time period does that represent? 
I know from a uh, database perspective, we can only store records back to 4,500 BC with our current system. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> uh, the, the peatland being around four and a half meters means it's probably at or a bit beyond that, that, that time frame. So we're talking about 5,000 years worth of, of peat development at the site. I, I should say the microbes we're interested in this project are the sort of contemporaneous ones, so the ones which are alive now and, and, and respiring that carbon right now. Um, yeah, I don't know if Casey wants to add anything about that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because there's some in some way we have to kind of pick apart what is the the kind of legacy signal from these really really ancient deposits and what is what the microbes are kind of doing today. And I think Finn's completely right. The things that we measure, especially near the surface, where you have a lot of these kind of fluctuations and degradation problems, um, those will be kind of contemporary processes. But yeah, maybe in the deep peat, I don't know, maybe you can add a little extra bit in your drop down menu for us if we want to put in some of that data from the very deep peat. I think I don't see any other ones. Um, Finn's already answered the question of, from Andrew Lucas. So I think that's it. Are there any other questions out there? I know um, Andrew's, I think, got, had some internet problems, so he keeps bouncing in and out. Um, but his questions about the reference library are really good. He, he's applied this technique to plants. I don't know if you want to add anything, Andrew, if you're still there. Ah, here we go. Are you able to get relative estimates of population sizes from your work? Yeah, maybe I can answer that one. So we'll get an estimate of where we can estimate from the PCR how many bacteria or archaea are, are in the, actually in the system. So that's something that's actually quite important to reference back because what you see when you look at the whole community sequences is the composition of that community, but then we normalize that to the numbers of cells that you have. Um, and it's it's a lot, so probably it's, a few billion cells in every teaspoon of soil. So it's a lot of a lot of microbes in a really small space. Fair enough. Uh, and uh, what role does the sphagnum plug planting have? Does it help the good microbes or is water level critical? Yeah, I think uh, I can take that. So the sphagnum plug planting is, is obviously crucial in terms of re-establishing that carbon input into the system. Um, but as the question touches on with, with water level being so important for the, for the microbes and whether the system is itself um, anoxic and waterlogged, well, actually the sphagnum, of course, will themselves, <coughs> sorry, themselves start to engineer that system because, because of the amount of water which the sphagnum themselves can, can hold like a, like a sponge. So actually having a functional plant community on the surface will have a knock-on effect for how wet the system itself is. Um, that bare peat surface means that the system will, will be drying out even more rapidly. So the sphag the sphag can play an important part, not just in terms of carbon input, but also helping create the community which the microbes can themselves then live 